Dr. Parmar is a specialist in geriatric medicine. She completed medical school residency in internal medicine and fellowship in geriatric medicine at UBC. She has a passion for expanding elder care throughout BC and founded Pacific Geriatricians Group as part of this goal. Active in medical education at UBC as a clinical assistant professor, she serves as an attending physician at Vancouver General Hospital, geriatrics curriculum theme lead and co-chair of Dementia Week for Undergraduate Medicine. She is also active in research as part of the Vancouver Coastal Health Falls Prevention Clinic and co-founded the Geriatric Perioperative Clinic in v at VGH. She has a particular interest in dementia, falls, and movement disorders. Dr. Parmar, welcome, and I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to give this talk. Uh, I have a, a great passion for uh, treating dementia and also Parkinson's disease, so I'm very honored to be here. Um, as Alana mentioned, uh, the talk, I'm happy to take questions as we go through. Um, so I see in the chat box there we have the public one. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Um, please just type them in, um, and I'm happy to, to go along with that. Um, it is a shorter number of slides, so don't worry about taking up too much time with your questions as well. Um, so. We're going to go over a few things today. Um, so the first thing that we're going to be looking at is a definition of what actually is dementia. Um, from there, we're going to go through what the assessment for dementia actually entails. So if you're worried about a memory change for either yourself or your loved one, what you can expect uh, in terms of that assessment and why those questions are being asked or why those tests are being done. Uh, we're also going to look at the different subtypes of dementia because dementia is actually quite a broad spectrum. Um, not just Alzheimer's disease, uh, not just Parkinson's dementia, uh, but many others as well that we'll just touch on uh, so that you're aware of them. Uh, we'll then move into the treatment options for dementia so that you can know what to expect and what is available out there. Uh, and just a quick review, some take home points that we'll go through as well. Um, so going forward, uh, we'll start with the first thing, which is the definition of dementia. Um, so dementia medically uh, in our academic world has actually had a name change uh, and is now officially called major neurocognitive disorder. Uh, and to be honest, on a day-to-day -day basis, that doesn't really make much difference. Uh, it does make a difference for us as physicians in terms of what we code things as and how we talk amongst ourselves in terms of our letters. Uh, but for the average public uh, and in our conversations with our patients, we still use the word dementia. Um, the definition of that uh, does require a, a few key points. Um, as you can see here, it requires evidence that there's been a change uh, from the previous level uh, in either complex attention, so being able to manage multiple tasks, um, executive ability, so decision making, short term memory, language, so your fluency with your language, grammatically correct, uh, and also using the correct, correct names for people and, and objects, perceptual changes. Um, so understanding that what a tool is and what it's actually for. Um, so as I see here on my desk, I have my, my safety goggles as I'm at the hospital right now. So remembering that these are goggles and these are for safety to cover my eyes, um, that type of memory. Uh, social cognition as well, um, which is a, a, a memory of what you're supposed to be doing in a certain situation. So when going to a restaurant, uh, realizing that you should be answering the, the waiter who's asking you a question, but not asking him a lot of questions about himself. Um, or you know, if you're at the library, realizing that you should be quiet because in this social situation, you're meant to be quiet. Um, and then you also look at other potential causes uh, of medical illness, such as B12 deficiency and delirium um, and depression. Uh, and you wanna rule all of those things out uh, when we're officially looking for a definition of dementia. Now, as I said, that's the academic uh, diagnosis of the disease. Uh, when we're looking at it uh, in our offices, when we're looking at it day to day with people, we actually look at really three things. Um, the first thing that we look at is, does that person themselves or does their loved or does one of their loved ones see that there is a change uh, in their memory from before? Um, so a subjective complaint, as we call it. The next thing that we look at then is there an objective deficit. So looking at a person's level of education uh, and giving them a memory test, does it seem that their score on the memory test uh, is lower than we would expect? Um, or if we're lucky enough to have had a previous memory test as a baseline, has there now been a decline on that new memory test? 
Uh, and then we also look at a third piece, which is our key feature, uh, which is really the, the clinching uh, kind of part of the diagnosis is that has this memory change actually affected your day-to-day -day life? So are there things that you used to be able to do that you can no longer do? Um, common examples that we have are for people who previously uh, were able to manage their finances. Um, so they were able to keep track of when their bills were due. They were able to keep track of when they were expecting uh, deposits into their account uh, and everything was fine. And now suddenly bills are being mistakenly double paid or they've gone past date and you're having to pay interest on that. Um, or being in your own home and previously perhaps being able to use certain tools like the microwave uh, or the remote control for the television. Uh, and now suddenly not being able to do those things the same as before uh, and having to have other people step in to help you. Um, and so, as I said, that's the key feature. And that's really the clinching thing that we look at uh, is that you can have complaints about memory changes and you can do poorly on a memory test. Uh, and there's lots of things that can explain that. Um, but having that loss of function uh, really points towards a dementia being diagnosed. Um, with the dementia, um, of course, that word means different things to different people. Um, and there can often be a normalization of memory changes. Uh, I have many of my patients come in and say, yes, I have some dementia, but I'm 84. Uh, and they'll normalize that and they'll say that this is just part of aging. Uh, when in fact, memory loss is not a normal part of aging. There is a normal change with memory. Uh, and that change is actually memory slowing. Um, so that can be a lag time where you're trying to retrieve a piece of information and it might take you a few minutes, it might take you a few hours, but that piece of information still comes forward. Um, memory loss would be if you go to retrieve that information and you don't have it there. Um, so an example that I often give to my, sorry, a simile I should say that I often give to my patients when I meet them uh, is that if we had a computer uh, that was gathering information for 75 years or 85 years or however old that patient is, and we went to that computer and we typed in a file name. We would think it's fair for that computer to take quite some time to whirl and whirl and bring up that file because that computer has 75 years worth of data to go through. It has to search through so many people's names or so many events that it has to go through to, to retrieve that one memory and bring it forward. Uh, and that is normal aging where it can take some time, but it's always there. Where we have dementia is if we go to that computer and we type in the file name uh, and then it whirls and whirls and whirls and then we come back with an error message that says file not found. Um, so in real life that would be thinking and trying to remember that person's name but then when someone finally tells you their name saying no I never knew that before. So that queuing doesn't actually bring up the memory or time doesn't bring up the memory that memory was actually lost. Um, so that's the difference between normal aging which is memory slowing and true dementia, which is a memory loss. Okay. So we look at, so if we have a patient who has a concern with their memory, we then want to move on to an assessment uh, of their memory for the diagnosis of dementia. Um, so it is very appropriate uh, if you have some concerns to bring this up. Um, I know that sometimes there can be a, a social awkwardness of bringing this up with your loved one uh, where you don't want to insult them. Uh, where people often say, well, do you think I'm crazy or do you think I've lost my marbles or, or things like that? Um, and we really want to change that thought process because that's not at all what we're saying. Uh, dementia is a disease. Uh, it is not a label. Uh, and it is a disease of uh, organ of your body. Uh, very similar to how someone can have heart disease. Uh, you can also have dementia, which is really just chronic brain disease. Uh, it just happens to have a different name. Um, so it is important that if you're seeing these changes in yourself or in your loved one to bring them forward because they're not meant to be a label, they're meant to be investigating your medical concerns. And it's also helpful to assess them earlier rather than later so that we can begin a treatment plan uh, because early diagnosis in dementia does make a significant difference on our management uh, and makes a difference upon your kind of prognosis as well. Um, now, in terms of that first step, um, the first steps are if you had a concern about your memory would be to talk to your primary care physician. Um, so whether that is your family doctor or whether that is your nurse practitioner, um, that is the first person that you would bring this up with. Um, if you're not fortunate enough to have a family doctor, you can go into a local walking clinic and bring up these questions as well. Family doctors are very well versed in, in dealing with the initial parts of this. After talking to you and asking you some questions about your subjective concerns, 
you know, what are you actually seeing? Uh, and perhaps doing a quick uh, kind of review of function to ask you if there's been any deficit. Uh, the primary care physician will then likely refer you on to a specialist. Uh, and in British Columbia, there are three different types of specialties that actually uh, cover, kind of overlap with dementia. Um, they are geriatric medicine, which is a doctor like myself. Um, so internal medicine and then extra training for over two years in, in geriatric syndromes. Um, that can be a geriatric psychiatrist, um, who similarly is someone who has completed psychiatry uh, and then did extra training specifically in geriatric syndromes and psychiatry, or a neurologist um, who has done extra training in cognitive uh, concerns. Usually they do their five years and an extra year or two as well. Um, so you can be referred on to one of those specialists. And being referred on to a specialist are the recommendations right now within Canada, um, because this is a complex disease and it's a lot to ask of a family doctor to be able to manage all of the assessment for this. Um, I also wanted to note that, uh, of course, COVID has to be uh, commented on in every talk, uh, in every conversation, almost, I feel, that we have with each other right now. And it has had an impact uh, on the way that we function. Um, interestingly, though, with the cognitive impairment with dementias, it's actually had a positive impact uh, because it has forced us as physicians to move into this realm and to move into the virtual realm. Um, and memory testing and conversations about it are actually very easily done uh, via virtual health. Um, so whether that be with a telephone call or whether that be with a video conference, uh, it is actually very easy to, to do those initial dementia screens this way. And we do have special memory tests that are focused for just virtual health as well. Um, so don't feel that right now that COVID-19 and our restrictions and, and following the protocols and being safe means that you can't have your memory tested. In fact, it means the opposite. It means that we can very easily connect with you right now. Um, and it's also meant that we've... Um, moved along uh, in terms of, of being able to access the entire province because if you're virtual it doesn't matter uh, you know if you're up in the north I mean, I'm originally from the north myself and I know how difficult it is to access care or, or whether you're just down the street in Vancouver you can access that equally so if you do have concerns do bring it up um, I see a question here that uh, someone has asked is, is is someone with Parkinson's more likely to suffer from dementia uh, and the answer to that is yes um, we're going to come through to the numbers the statistics regarding that in just a little bit as we go through the different subtypes um, but just to jump ahead a bit, um, the incidence of, of dementia and Parkinson's disease actually increases with time. Uh, and by 10 year mark after your diagnosis, about 80% of people with Parkinson's disease will actually also have dementia uh, at the same time. Um, so hopefully for guest 446, that answers your question, but we will get to a little bit more detail about that too, as well in a few slides. Uh, so if you are uh, wondering about uh, having a change with your, your memory and you wanting to have that assessment, um, you want to know what to expect. Um, so the questions that will come up um, that the physician will find very helpful to ask you is, when have you noticed these changes? Um, and knowing all of these things help us determine what type of pattern of memory change you have. Uh, and again, I will go through the different subtypes and the different patterns in a few slides as well. Um, so knowing if this was a sudden change. Uh, after an, uh, a medical illness, uh, or was this a gradual change that you've been seeing? Um, has it just happened over a few months, or has it been a few years that you've been seeing this happen? Um, have there been any major safety concerns that have occurred? Um, the classic one that we ask about is safety around the kitchen, so uh, leaving the stove on and letting a pot burn through, uh, risking, of course, a fire, um, leaving the house and locking yourself out, um, safety with driving, if there have been concerns regarding that. We'll also ask you things about mood because there's a lot of overlap in terms of the diagnosis with mood and also certain symptoms from mood. So um, has someone become a bit more irritable? Have they become a bit more jovial? Um, have they lost their social filter and they're inappropriate in certain times or not? Um, have there been any hallucinations uh, or delusions which are very important to follow along in Parkinson's disease um, because they can uh, actually be a symptom of particular um, dementias that happen? Um, and also, they'll ask you a few background questions about your risk factors for memory changes like uh, educational level, history of smoking, alcohol use, drug use, um, if you've had any concerns with cholesterol problems before, like heart attacks or strokes, uh, if you've had any head injuries, uh, like concussions. I know concussions became far more uh, prevalent in our day-to-day um, -day, uh, discussions and with dementia uh, after a few years ago when the NFL uh, in the U.S. Uh, and actually the NHL across both borders discussed how head injuries are actually a, a marker for increased risk of dementia as well. Um, and we'll also ask you about family history. So particularly your first degree relatives, your parents, um, and also your siblings as to whether or not they've had any memory changes. Um, they'll also be very specific about a functional review. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to have thought about this before your doctor's appointment. 
Um, so the question, sorry, I just noticed the question came up. What can we do to slow down the onset of dementia? We will get to that as well um, in just a moment. Um, I'll just finish up with what to expect in terms of a cognitive review. Um, so you will have to be asked some very specific questions um, about day-to-day uh, -day activities. So, you know, who does the shopping? Who does the housekeeping? Um, who's managing the finances? Things like that. Not that we're trying to be intrusive, but that helps us determine how your brain is actually functioning. Also, some questions about um, your activities of daily living. Um, so those would be activities such as bathing and dressing, um, managing those on your own, your personal hygiene and things. Um, there are symptoms that can overlap um, with dementia, such as anxiety uh, and also uh, confusion from a, a medical illness, uh, which is why we often um, will ask these questions so that we can delineate between those two. Um, so based upon that, that history that you get, your doctor will then also want to go through your medical list and do an exam and do a memory test. Um, and the standard memory test is something that we won't go through today, but it is called a mini mental status exam. Um, and it's a standard 30 point test if you do it in person and 22 points if you do it over the phone or by a video conference. And it, it really helps us to guide in terms of the diagnosis. Um, they'll also look at doing some blood work and doing some scans as well. Um, so you can expect that to be looked into. Um, there are things that can cause uh, memory changes uh, that can be reversible, such as a B12 deficiency, um, thyroid changes. Sometimes if your electrolytes, such as your sodium and your potassium, are not quite right, that can, uh, that can actually mimic uh, dementia. So your doctor will want to screen for that. Uh, and you'll also either get a CT scan or an MRI uh, so that we can look at the different areas of your brain um, and see if there has been a change or not. Um, and if there has been a change, uh, what type of pattern of change that actually goes through. So um, as we go through that, um, that kind of history, the physical exam with the, with the memory testing, and then we get all of our blood work and our CT scan, we will eventually come to a diagnosis. Uh, and our diagnosis is often not dementia with patients who come in. Often we can actually identify things like depression, which are causing these symptoms. And depression is very common in our Parkinson's population as well. Um, we can often just say this is actually normal aging based upon the history, uh, or we may be left with a di diagnosis of dementia itself. Um, and when we look at that dementia, we want to see what subtype it is, um, because there are different subtypes. So dementia is an umbrella term that means memory loss. And beneath that umbrella, there are different types. So Alzheimer's disease is a type of disease that is neurodegenerative, um, which is very similar uh, to Parkinson's in that it is a, pro it is a progressive disease. Um, but Alzheimer's follows a particular pattern. Uh, it starts first with short term memory uh, and then it marches through different areas of the brain. The second most common type of dementia is vascular dementia, uh, and that is a dementia that occurs when you've had poor blood flow to the brain, um, that we'll talk about a little bit more as well. Uh, Parkinson's dementia is something that we're going to go through in just a few seconds as well as a separate slide on it. Um, we talk about Lewy body disease as well, frontotemporal dementia, mixed, and then normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is very important for our Parkinson's patients as there often can be a misdiagnosis between those two there. So Alzheimer's disease, as I said, is the most common by far. Uh, and about two thirds of all cases of dementia are actually Alzheimer's disease. Um, and though we know that, as we said before, about 80% of people with Parkinson's disease will actually develop a dementia, um, we know that it's not always a Parkinson's dementia. Very often there's actually an overlap where people will have both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease at the same time, uh, which is why I wanted to go over this one first. Um, as I said, it starts with short-term memory uh, changes first, uh, and then it will move into language. So to begin with, someone might have trouble to keeping track of their calendar, and they'll start to miss due dates or start to miss appointments. Uh, and then as the disease progresses, you'll actually start to find that language changes as well. Um, so they'll no longer be able to remember names, um, they'll use the wrong word for an object, or they'll be pausing and searching for a word or um, kind of filling in the gaps. So rather than saying, yes, hand me that pen, they'll say, hand me that thing that writes um, things like that will actually change with Alzheimer's disease. Similar to uh, Parkinson's disease, it is, as I said, neurodegenerative, so it is a loss of cells within the brain. Um, with Parkinson's disease, uh, it is actually uh, an inclusion body, something called a Lewy body that causes the trouble. With Alzheimer's disease, it's actually more plaques and tangles, so it's actually a physical loss of, of cells at a much, more, a much, much higher rate than Parkinson's disease, uh, which is why Alzheimer's disease tends to progress much faster than Parkinson's disease. Um, and as I said, again, it is very, it is possible to have both at the same time, and it can be very common to have both at the same time. 
The next type of dementia is also quite common in Parkinson's disease as well. It's called vascular dementia. Uh, and this is when there is poor blood flow to the brain. Uh, when the blood flow to the brain is sluggish, uh, you don't have the oxygen, you don't have the glucose, the sugars that you need. Um, and so when those cells don't get the nutrients that they need, they will start to die off. But rather than dying off in a big space all at once, it'll, you'll have small little bits of death, throughout, of cell death throughout the brain. And when that becomes significant enough, it actually starts to affect the function of your brain. Um, there are certain things that put you at higher risk for this. Um, so being more sedentary um, is by far uh, the, the biggest risk for this. Um, along with that, uh, untreated, untreated high blood pressure, untreated diabetes. Um, I should have also added into this slide untreated high cholesterol are, are common causes uh, of vascular dementia. Um, but with our Parkinson's patients in particular, we do worry because Parkinson's disease itself lends to a more sedentary lifestyle because you have difficulty with mobility. Um, and because of that, you don't have as much blood flow, you're not as active, and so the risk of vascular dementia does go up with that. Um, there can also be a different form of vascular dementia, which occurs suddenly uh, when you have a stroke and you have a major area of your brain actually losing, um, losing blood flow. Um, but by far, the, my, the tiny little bits of cell death through time from uncontrolled other diseases is the, the greater cause of it. Um, it is diagnosed uh, by, a, by a imaging. So this is one of the reasons why it's important for us to get a CT scan or an MRI um, so that we can really see what type of dementia you actually have. And if it's vascular, we can kind of focus on your risk factors. Um, if we see this type of dementia, we'll, we'll work really hard on your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and your blood sugars. Uh, to ensure that you don't actually have this going forward. Um, now this leads back to our question that we had of what can we do to slow down the onset of dementia. Um, and one of the biggest, thing you, biggest things you can do is actually prevent these diseases from happening, prevent yourself from being sedentary, prevent yourself from having a high blood pressure that's uncontrolled, prevent yourself from having diabetes that's uncontrolled. So maintaining some physical activity is crucial uh, because it improves the blood flow to your brain. We recommend at least 150 minutes, so 150 minutes per week. Um, so that can be 30 minutes, five, uh, five days a week, or, or sometimes we just average that out to be about 20 to 30 minutes every day of, of exercise. Um, and that is a type of exercise that improves the blood flow to your brain. So that would be cardiovascular exercise, uh, exercise where you're improving your heart rate, um, so the blood flow increases. It doesn't have to be where you're huffing and puffing and sweating. Um, even a nice walk um, will help. Um, but it does need to be extra exercise that you're doing on top of your day to day activities. Um, so saying that, well, I walk up and down the stairs with the laundry hamper is my exercise doesn't actually work in this situation. Um, we know that it needs to be extra exercise um, focused on just your mobility uh, and again, getting your heart rate up. Uh, that helps to prevent uh, dementia from getting worse. Um, and along with that is also making sure that you're getting your blood pressure checked regularly, uh, having your blood work done at least yearly um, so with your family doctor so that you know what your blood sugars are, you know what your cholesterol levels are, and if you need to make some diet changes, you're making those early um, before you actually have the damage accumulating in your brain. Um, so those are the things that are really crucial in terms of preventing um, the onset of dementia is maintaining that physical, um, that physical mobility and that general health so your brain has its best chance. Um, so Parkinson's dementia itself, um, as I said, the dementia does occur in 50 to 80 percent of people with Parkinson's disease. Um, of that's of all types of dementia, roughly about 50 percent of it will be a Parkinson's dementia itself. Um, and by definition, this is a dementia that occurs one year after the onset of your first Parkinson's symptoms. So this happens; it has to happen a year after you first noticed a change within your body. Um, it starts by affecting attention first, so different um, than Alzheimer's disease, um, with Alzheimer's disease affecting short-term memory. Parkinson's dementia actually affects your ability to multitask first. Uh, it affects your ability to plan and to problem solve. Um, it'll also slow down your thinking as well. Um, similar in that with Parkinson's disease, you notice a slowing of your movement. Um, with Parkinson's dementia, you'll notice a slowing of thought as well. Um, and there can also be an effect on mood uh, that happens and that Parkinson's disease itself puts you at risk of depression, but Parkinson's dementia also has symptoms of a low mood that often occur. 
Um, it is the same disease that's causing the motor symptoms, that's causing the physical symptoms that starts to affect the areas of the brain of memory. Um, so it is once again those Lewy bodies that are accumulating uh, and causing those cells to die within the brain and then starting to affect your memory centers. Um, because of the pattern of Parkinson's dementia, uh, it will tend to affect your occipital lobe, which is the lobe in the back, um, as well as your temporal lobe here at the same time. Um, and so because of those changes in your occipital lobe, which controls your vision and your, your brain's understanding of your senses, because there's a, a deficit there, sometimes your brain can make mistakes. Uh, and those mistakes lead to hallucinations and delusions. Um, so an incidence of auditory, auditory or um, visual hallucinations is much higher in Parkinson's dementia. Uh, and there's also a much higher rate of paranoia um, at the first onset uh, of Parkinson's dementia. So um, it is common for all people with dementia to develop paranoia because you have a memory loss. Um, and when you have a memory loss, your brain wants to explain that. It has to make sense of that. Um, so it's, it's hard to reckon with yourself that, yes, I, I have a memory problem. So often people will put that blame on someone else. So if you can't find the shovel in the garage, rather than thinking, oh, I forgot where I left the shovel, uh, a paranoid person with Parkinson's disease will actually start to go down a paranoid uh, pathway of somebody's doing this on purpose. Um, my brain's fine. I'm totally okay. It's someone else has actually gone and stolen the shovel or someone has moved the shovel to try and make me look bad. Um, so that's the type of paranoia that will actually come about with dementia. Um, I'm looking at a question here. Does a person with Parkinson's dementia tend to remember people's names and relationships longer than people with Alzheimer's disease? Um, as a general rule of thumb, the answer to that question would be yes, um, because the different areas of the brain are affected in a different pattern. So with Alzheimer's disease, names and relationships would be affected sooner than with Parkinson's dementia. Um, so yes, uh, Alzheimer's disease would um, affect it earlier. Okay. Um, looking at the uh, Parkinson's uh, dementia as well, it's also important to remember that the severity of your disease um, also affects how quickly you'll develop dementia if you develop dementia with Parkinson's disease. Um, so if someone has a very quick onset of their symptoms um, and they have very profound symptoms within just a couple of years, they are more likely to develop a dementia earlier. Uh, for other people who take uh, a more kind of slow, indolent kind of pattern, um, they may not have dementia symptoms up until five to ten years after their initial diagnosis. Um, so that diagnosis of dementia at the one year mark is not necessarily it happens right at one year. It just has to be more than one year, and very often it is actually longer than that one year that you start to see those symptoms actually come up. I'm just going to pause for a second and see if anyone wanted to type any other questions specifically to Parkinson's dementia because we're talking about it here. Okay, I'm not seeing any there. So if they do come in, though, I will come back to it. So, of course, I know that this is a focus of this talk today. Um, another very similar uh, disease and a very similar dementia is Lewy body dementia, um, which you may have heard of uh, if you've looked into the different types of Parkinson's. Um, so it's very similar um, in that they are caused by the same thing. Oh, so here's a question. Uh, does Parkinson's dementia affect speech, I believe, is the question. Um, it does not affect the speech production. Um, the Parkinson's disease itself does. So Parkinson's disease has a low tone. Oh, sorry, my my uh, lights just turned off in my room. There we go. I just have to keep moving. Apparently I'm being too sedentary. Um, so Parkinson's disease itself affects speech because it affects the muscles that control your speech. So you will have a slower speech and you will have a lower tone of speech. Um, but the dementia itself does not affect your speech. Um, so it will not affect your ability to produce speech. Uh, you may speak differently in terms of your choice of words, um, or you may forget a word, or you may forget a name eventually, um, but it doesn't affect your actual ability to produce speech. Okay. Um, so back to Lily body uh, dementia. So oh, uh, does celiac disease affect Parkinson's dementia? Um, there is no particular connection between celiac disease and Parkinson's dementia itself. Um, celiac disease is an autoimmune disease, um, and Parkinson's dementia is actually a degenerative disease. 
uh, which is um, a very different type of disease. So there's no direct correlation, correlation between the two of them. Um, and getting back to Diane's question about affecting speech, uh, if you clarify that, yes, Parkinson's um, disease, sorry, Parkinson's dementia does affect word finding, but not the, uh, the actual production of speech. Uh, and the question for George is, will we be discussing treatment of possibilities? Yes, I will be. I will be getting to that. Um, another question here is, is it the Parkinson's disease or the dementia that brings on dysphagia? It's actually the Parkinson's disease that brings on dysphagia, uh, not the dementia itself. Okay, lots of good questions here. Um, so coming back to Lewy body disease, it's a very similar disease. It has the same base problem with the Lewy bodies actually causing the cell death but it happens much faster. Um, so by definition with Lewy body disease, you have the motor symptoms first. Um, so you actually have the change in your mobility first, and you have the dementia within a year of having the diagnosis of uh, Parkinson's disease. So it's a quicker onset of both the motor and the memory problems together. Um, that is important because Lewy body disease does tend to progress much faster. Um, and so we will be much more diligent in terms of our follow-up and when we'll put in treatment supports and other things like that with Lewy body disease. Um, it's also important because people with Lewy body disease tend to be very sensitive to a class of medications called antipsychotics um, that sometimes we have to use in people with dementia. Um, so knowing the difference of whether the patient has a Parkinson's dementia or whether they have a Lewy body dementia helps us when we're choosing the medications in the long run. Uh, when you have antipsychotics in a patient with Lewy body disease, they will practically freeze. Uh, they will actually get locked in. Um, and it, that can be very distressing for the patient themselves. And unfortunately, there's no, um, there's no cure. There's no antidote for that. So we have to actually wait until the person is metabolized out the drug. So again, it can be very distressing. So that's why it's important to differentiate Lewy body from Parkinson's disease. Um, there's also another subtype called frontal temporal dementia. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, but just to let you know that it occurs, that it does exist and it does occur, usually in people who are a bit younger. Um, but because uh, it can actually affect both your memory and your behaviors, as well as your ability to walk well, uh, it can often be considered in the differential diagnosis. Uh, it can be considered as one of the potentials when you're looking at a person with Parkinson's disease. Um, so if you are being assessed for dementia, you might hear of this, this term of frontal temporal dementia um, as it has a lot of symptoms that overlap. Um, the big difference to clinch it for us is actually your CT scan. Um, so that's why when we look at the CT scan, we can differentiate between Parkinson's or Lewy body and a frontal temporal dementia. Uh, that may be there. There is also a mixed dementia pattern uh, where people can have multiple different types of dementia at the same time. Um, but mixed dementia usually refers to specifically Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia happening at the same time. Um, so that's again why we look at your imaging and we look at the pattern of change uh, in your brain to see if we find signs of both Alzheimer's disease and the vascular disease uh, or if it's just one or the other. Uh, the last one to go through is something called normal pressure hydrocephalus. And I, I brought this one up in this talk as well because it also overlaps with Parkinson's disease because it does have a very classic shuffling gait, uh, which many people will know of as a, as a classic sign of Parkinson's disease as well. Um, so again, um, when you're first being assessed, at, your doctor may go through some of these questions with you about normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, it's uncommon to have both normal pressure hydrocephalus and Parkinson's uh, disease at the same time, but it can happen. Um, so your doctor will also want to ask you questions about this disease and the specifics of this one are that there's a new onset of dementia that was pretty rapid actually, um, that there's that classic shuffling gait that you see, and also that there's new urinary incontinence, so new inability to control the bladder. Um, and all of these symptoms can happen through time with a Parkinson's patient, but with normal pressure hydrocephalus, they all occur at the same time. Um, so they all have the onset beginning within the same time and they all get pretty significant within just a few months. Um, but your doctors will likely bring this up with you as well and ask you questions about normal pressure hydrocephalus. Okay, so now we're getting into treatment of dementia, which is something that everyone I'm sure is very interested to know about. Um, so the first thing to remember, as I said before, is that it is a diagnosis, um, but it is not a comment on your abilities. It is not a comment on your intelligence. Uh, it's not a comment on your psychological state. Um, it is a, a disease that needs to be followed through time. So 
the first part of treatment is finding a physician and a care team that will take care of you and realize that this needs to be followed regularly. Um, just like you would continue to follow up with your diabetes doctor, just like you would continue to follow up with your Parkinson's disease doctor, you'd want to follow up with your, your uh, dementia doctor regularly. Um, it does mean as well, unfortunately, that there are no, uh, no, there are no magical cures uh, for this disease. It is a chronic disease um, and there are no ways to reverse the effects. So when you identify dementia, uh, our goal is to stabilize things to prevent them from getting worse through time. Um, so the earlier detection is very beneficial. Um, the earlier we have the diagnosis, the uh, better we can actually stabilize things. Uh, and also the earlier we have the diagnosis, the more functional a person will remain. Um, so that's again why it's very important. Um, there are strategies that I'll go through in just a few seconds um, regarding how to prevent the worsening of the disease. Um, and as I said, stability is what we hope for. And when we say stability, um, that sounds like a simple word, but it actually means quite a bit to our patients. So stability of your memory means that you don't need extra help uh, going forward, hopefully. You may still need a little bit, but hopefully not a major amount of extra help. Um, so that translates into maintaining your independence, staying in your own home, uh, and hopefully not needing to move into long-term care, uh, such as a nursing home down the line because of, of the memory change. Um, so the the foundation uh, of treatment for dementia is actually lifestyle. More than any medication, um, more than any other suggestion that we can make, it's actually lifestyle changes that make a big difference. Um, and maintaining this good lifestyle before memory changes happen is actually our prevention strategies as well, as I mentioned before. Um, so keeping your physical activity going is crucial. Um, at least 20 minutes of, of cardiovascular exercise every day uh, once you've had a diagnosis of dementia is important. Um, again, as I said before, that is to improve the blood flow to the brain. Even if you have a different type of dementia than vascular dementia, so if you have Parkinson's dementia, if you have Alzheimer's dementia, we know that the physical activity has a huge impact in terms of preventing the disease from getting worse. And again, that doesn't need to be onerous exercise. Uh, that can just be going for a walk. But it has to be that targeted extra exercise not just your daily activities of day-to-day -day life. Um, the next thing to, to highlight as well is that you want to stay um, mentally active as well. Uh, mentally stimulated activities help um, both from a psychological point of view but also from a physical point of view because as you are stimulating your memory centers you are continuing to produce all those good chemicals in your brain and neurotransmitters um, and the more that you're stimulating that the more that you create the stronger your brain and your memory centers actually are. Um, so we want all of our patients who have uh, any memory changes, even if they're mild, to really focus on mentally stimulated activities. Um, so those are things like reading, artwork, um, any sort of hobbies that you may have, um, you know, playing sports, playing card games, all of these types of things. And these are all helpful things because they help to focus your attention. You know, so if you're reading, um, you need to be able to focus on what is happening on the page in front of you. If you're reading a news story in the paper, you need to be able to hold what has happened in the first paragraph all the way into the last paragraph so you understand the entire story. Um, so that is actually quite important. Um, it is also important to challenge your memory. So if you are reading, you don't want to just put the paper down and forget about it. What you want to do is read that newspaper article and then hopefully a couple of hours later or even maybe the next morning, you can talk about what you've read because that forces you to create that memory and then bring it forward again. And using things that are not um, emotionally connected to you are actually more challenging for your memory. So if you're on the phone with your family, of course, hearing a story about um, your brother or your sister, you have an emotional connection to that. So it's easier for you to remember that. Um, but reading a story about what's happening in the stock market or reading a story about what happened uh, you know, in France or something else is not as emotionally connected. So it takes more effort for you to remember that. Um, so using those types of stimulating activities is important. And then also talking about them later on. So your brain is aware that it has to not just pay attention right now, but it has to hold on to that memory and then retrieve it later on. Uh, and you can do the same thing with television, you know, so um, if you are not an avid reader, if you're watching TV, um, you can, you know, of course, follow along the program and then maybe a few hours later or the next day, your family could ask, what did you watch on TV? Can you tell me a couple of details? 
um, you know, what is the name of the character? What city was the was the show based in, and things like that. Um, it shouldn't be to the point where you're feeling like you're being grilled. Uh, you don't want to feel like you're in front of a drill sergeant having to perform, or, or back in grammar school again. Um, but you should should still feel like there is that testing happening, that that questioning, so that you know that you're trying to pay attention to things. Um, as I said before, card games, crosswords, anything else like that that stimulates your memory is good. Um, we often get the question from our patients about whether they should be doing something new, uh, like should you suddenly start knitting, um, should you suddenly start reading when you never enjoyed it before, and the answer to that is no. Uh, we actually have a lot of good research that shows um, that if you didn't like to do something beforehand, trying to get someone with dementia to start it now will actually cause more harm than good because it will cause a lot more frustration. Uh, so you want to be using the, uh, the strategies that you've always used, the, the programs that you used to do before, um, to actually test your memory. You don't want to be adding in new things. Um, and the programs um, that are out there, such as Brain Games and Luminosity and the rest of them, they've never actually been shown to make a significant difference um, in dementia. Um, so if you didn't do them before, I would not start doing them now. Okay. So as I said, the foundation uh, for treatment for dementia is the physical activity and the mentally stimulating activity. Um, the next question that comes up is whether or not medications are helpful. Uh, so there are a class of medications that are suggested uh, for mild to moderate dementia. And those are a class of medications called cholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, now in uh, BC, or sorry, all of Canada, we actually have three of them that we use regularly. Um, they are called dinepazil, galantamine, and rivastigmine. Um, and these are all equivalent to each other. Um, so it doesn't really matter uh, which one of these drugs that you use. They're all equally effective. Um, and they all work in the same basic way uh, in that they improve the amount of acetylcholine in your brain, which is one of those neurotransmitters that we were talking about earlier, one of those chemicals uh, that your memory center uses to send messages between different cells. Uh, so by boosting the amount of acetylcholine that you have in your brain, your memory is more likely to be preserved and more likely to function at a higher level. Um, in BC in particular, uh, based upon your memory testing score, you can get approved for coverage for these medications. Um, the first line that's approved in British Columbia is dinepazil. Uh, its brand name is Aricept. Um, so that is the, what the majority of people within British Columbia are on. Uh, if you are intolerant to dinepazil, um, then your doctor can apply for coverage of another drug called galantamine uh, or even a third one, which is called rivastigmine, um, that is out there as well. Um, as I said, they're all equivalent. So if, um, you know, a lot of patients will go out and they'll read about a particular one and say they really want to be on rivastigmine. Uh, but to be honest, the, the different uh, trials show that there's no big difference between them. Um, so you're not losing out by being on tenepazole first. Um, all of these medications are taken by mouth um, as their first line, uh, which can lead to troubles with our Parkinson's patients because, of course, dysphagia and swallowing can be an issue. Uh, they are small pills. Um, they're about the size of a baby aspirin, um, so they're smaller medications and usually pretty well tolerated, but with dysphagia in particular, they can be difficult. Um, so an alternative for that is that the rivastigmine actually has a form of the patch uh, that you just apply to your skin. You can apply that to any area of your body. Most people will put it on their arm or on their back because it's easy to get to, but you can put it on your thighs uh, or your lower legs as well if you need to. Uh, it works just as well as swallowing the pills uh, in terms of its effectiveness. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not covered through Pharmacare, um, so it can get quite pricey. Uh, we're talking a, a, you know, a couple hundred dollars a month um, in terms of that cost for that patch. Um, but with some of our patients with Parkinson's disease who are unable to swallow, because we can't crush the pills easily for dementia, we will sometimes have to go to the patch route uh, instead. Um, all these medications are usually well tolerated. Um, the most common side effect is upset stomach. Um, but of course, the details of, of, of other potential side effects are really person dependent uh, based upon other medications you're on, whether diseases you might have. Um, so if you were to start on these, definitely talk to the person prescribing them for, uh, for you about the different side effects um, that you might uh, actually suffer from. Any questions about the treatment? I'll just pause again for a few seconds. Uh, if they are all equivalents, is there any point in trying others if you've had a severe side effect from dinepazil? 
Uh, this is something that we will will discuss uh, often with our patients who've had side effects from dinepazole. It depends upon how how severe the symptoms were. Um, if they were some severe symptoms um, like a sudden change in mood uh, or agitation, um, uh, or if they were things like changes with your sleep, um, often we won't try one of the other ones um, because that's usually a class effect. Um, if there are side effects so that are more stomach based, um, we will sometimes try one of the other ones because the stomach symptoms, the, the upset stomach or kind of the seasick feeling that it can give to about 10% of people, that can be drug dependent. Um, so there will be people who have upset stomach on dinepazil, but they'll be fine on galantamine. Um, so it is worth it to try some of the other ones, depending upon which side effect you actually have. Um, the next question is, do the medications lose their effect over time? So over time, um, it, it, the medications themselves don't lose their effectiveness. It really depends upon whether or not the disease is still progressing forward. Um, so if you have a neurodegenerative disorder like Alzheimer's disease, that disease still goes forward no matter what. Um, so there will be a point uh, where the disease has um, progressed sufficiently enough that the medication is not really helpful anymore. Um, so you will often stop the medication at that point in time. Um, we know, though, that that time where people become more severe is usually slowed down by being on something like dinepazole. Um, so people are usually able to stay in their own home for an extra five to seven years by staying on uh, dinepazole. Um, so they don't, they do lose their effectiveness over time, but it's because the disease has progressed forward. Um, on a disease like vascular dementia, which is more insult driven, so it's based upon your uncontrolled blood pressure um, or your uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, if those are all kept under control, then yes, the dinepazole does stay effective for the rest of your life. And you can actually see that stability um, going forward. All right, we're getting lots of questions here. Uh, the next question, what, what is the name of the third medication? So the medications are dinepazil, galantamine, and rivastigmine. So those are the three first-line medications that we have. Um, and thank you to guest number 799 who mentioned as we were talking about whether you should switch depending upon side effects. And as she mentions, her husband um, had an upset stomach with dinepazil, but is fine with galantamine. Uh, so thank you for giving that that, uh, that information. Uh, another person asks uh, that their husband is 80 years old with Parkinson's disease. Is there any way to tell if he is forget his forgetfulness is caused by age or the onset of dementia? Uh, example, he forgets what he's eaten. Um, so the difference between normal aging and dementia, as we said earlier in our slides, was that whether or not this is memory slowing or whether this is memory loss, um, so if your husband forgets what's, what he has eaten, if you give him some time uh, and that, that memory comes back to him on his own, that is just normal aging. Um, but if you give him some time and he just cannot remember what he has eaten, that's memory loss. And so that would be a dementia. So that would be the difference there. Uh, the next question is, is there any research in the effect of CBD oil? Um, so CBD oil uh, itself um, is not considered a treatment uh, for dementia. Um, it can be helpful for some of the behaviors that come along with dementia, um, for people who will get agitated, who will get anxiety and things like that. Uh, it can be helpful for those symptoms of dementia, but for the disease itself, they have not been uh, actually helpful. Um, all right, and so then the question up here is, uh, a follow-up is that if they're equivalent uh, is there any point in trying another one? And then the severe symptoms were actually derivatives to sleep. Um, of course, discussing with your particular physician would probably be best in this situation. Um, but usually if the symptoms are related to sleep, it's usually a class effect. Um, I'm sorry, there's a, there is a short term, a short form here that I'm not actually aware of. So does RBD an indicator of possible dementia? I'm sorry, I don't, Diane, I'm not sure exactly what RBD is that you're referring to. If you could type that out for me, that would be great. Okay, um, and just as Diane is actually typing that out for me so I can know what her question is more clearly, um, I will go on to the next slide, which just uh, indicates that, um, as we said, cholinesterase inhibitors are helpful for, oh, sorry, REM sleep behavior um, for Diane's question. So um, REM sleep behavior is uh, not as prevalent uh, within dementia itself. Uh, it is uh, not really as considered a symptom of dementia as it is uh, actually managed by different parts of the brain and different neurochemicals. 
Um, so uh, REM sleep behavior changes are usually more in keeping with uh, Parkinson's like presentation or another disease happening rather than dementia itself. Um, so the next slide here that we have is just regarding the treatments. Um, and so there is a treatment for moderate to severe dementia, uh, which is called Nemantine. Uh, its brand name is Abixa. Uh, it does not have any effect on the progression of the disease. Uh, but with patients who have more moderate to severe dementia, and these are people who usually total care, so people who are actually in a nursing home, they will often be quite frightened because of their memory deficits. Uh, and because of that fear, because they can't remember what's happening, um, they will often act out. Uh, they'll either be quite tearful or they can be quite aggressive. Uh, and that's where the nemantine is actually used to help um, with the symptoms there. Um, as we've kind of touched on, there can be behavioral changes, as I just said. Um, you know, with memory loss, it's a feeling of being lost in time and space. So there are some medications that we look at for treatments for those things as well. Um, antidepressants are often prescribed for patients who have dementia to deal with these symptoms. Um, it can be the anxiety around the memory loss or it can be the irritability that comes along with disease as well. Um, and so there are often are, are medications that are used. The ones that are considered safe, particularly in dementia, are medications called citalopram mirtazapine and sertraline. Um, and these have all been shown to be safe in the disease itself, but also safe with the cholinesterase inhibitors. So it's safe to be on denepazil and citalopram at the same time. Um, so just that, so, so you're aware that there are often extra kind of treatments that come along with treating someone with dementia as well. Um, if the behaviors, if, if the concerns um, with uh, being frightened actually lead a person to lashing out, um, if they get to the point where they are actually physically violent um, or they are causing harm to themselves or others, um, that is where we actually have to use uh, antipsychotics uh, in that time. Uh, and again, it's not because we're saying that someone is psychotic, it's because we're saying that their behaviors are at the point where they're causing harm to themselves. Um, so antipsychotics like uh, quetiapine, risperidone, and olanzapine are often used in these patients. Um, and that's why it's important in Parkinson's disease to differentiate between Lewy body disease uh, sorry, Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's dementia. Because in Parkinson's dementia, these medications are safe. Um, but in Lewy body dementia, they will cause a locked in um, syndrome, which can be quite distressing. Um, so that's why, as we talked earlier on in the, the assessment, why it's important for the doctor to ask you lots of questions and go through the full workup to get your subtype so we know what medications are safe to use going forward. Um, we do use these medications very cautiously. Uh, because they do have a whole host of side effects along with them. So again, they're only used in the case where you were a danger to yourself or others, um, because there is an increased risk of falls and confusion and, and lots of other things that can happen. Um, so if you're at the point where these are being prescribed, you really need to be followed closely, uh, usually by a geriatric medicine doctor or geriatric, uh, just, sorry, ger geriatric psychiatry um, that specializes in following these diseases. Um, supports are also key. Um, they are very, very crucial. Uh, in terms of a, a, a plan for dementia. Um, it's not just the person, the patient themselves who has dementia, it's their family. Uh, you know, you're having to, to help your loved one out uh, because they know they're no longer able to balance their checkbook uh, or you're going shopping for them or doing the cooking. Um, it's also distressing to not be able to carry on the same conversations that you could before. Um, you know, not being sure if a person will remember an incident um, or not being sure if they remember the name of the, the person you're talking about. Um, this can all really affect the entire family. So it's important to look towards these support groups um, and to look towards uh, education regarding the disease. Um, understanding your specific subtype starts with your diagnosis from your physician and some understanding there. Uh, you can also be referred on to a neuropsychologist. Um, I am lucky enough to work with a great one um, who has a PhD uh, where he focused specifically on cognition. And there are many like him across the province as well. Um, they are trained not only in the diagnosis of dementia, but also in supporting and counseling around it as well. Um, a case manager through your local health unit is also important um, because they will help uh, you connect with what resources are in your community, whether that be a day program, uh, whether that be a support group uh, or other things. Uh, and the Alzheimer's Society also has a great program called First Link, um, which you can connect with, which gives, which gives you lots of education and support. Um, we have a question here. So some Parkinson's meds are anticholinergic. Are they a problem for are they a problem for the dementia medications? 
The anticholinergic med medications um, are a concern uh, when we come to treatment for Parkinson's disease because they are counteracting what we want. We want to actually have more acetylcholine, and the anticholinergic medications are actually preventing that. Um, so right off the bat, the anticholinergic medications can cause confusion to be worse and actually worsen the dementia symptom because of that. Um, and they will cause uh, more of a, a barrier towards your dimethazole uh, from actually working because it's having to, to actually overcome the anticholinergic effect. So yes, you'll have less benefit from a medication like dimethazole if you're already on an anticholinergic. Um, getting back to the supports, um, in British Columbia, there are also many supports that are available to you, uh, private supports, public supports, um, through places um, like your health unit. Um, so uh, through my clinic that I run, we have a, a list of them off of our website. So if you are wanting to know about more supports, there is a, a, just a nice little list of all of them off of our website here that I put up for you um, that you can look through. Okay. So some take home points as we're, we're ending right at the end of the session and we have more questions in between us than I thought we would. Um, so dementia is a common disease. It happens to 50 to 80% of people with Parkinson's. Uh, the key function that you look for is, uh, sorry, the key thing to look for is a loss of function uh, in terms of your assessment. If you have concerns, getting assessed sooner rather than later is very important. Uh, and right now we are still able to assess people. So please do not feel that the pandemic restrictions are a reason to not get assessed. Um, you can very easily get assessed. Um, there are many different subtypes, so the workup is important. Um, the treatment plan really focuses on those physical aspects and mentally stimulant activities, and then the medications as a second line. Um, and the education and supports are there and available to you, um, so be sure to access them if you have questions. And now I think we only have about two minutes left, but if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them as quickly as I can. Now. Naz, I had a couple of questions, if you, if you didn't mind. Sure, sure. Um, for someone who has um, dementia with Parkinson's, what might be some changes that need to be made um, at home? Um, so, so the changes made at home would really be, I think, first starting off with the treatment plan. Um, so trying to change your lifestyle so that you're encouraging the physical exercise, making that a key part of your daily activities. Um, also making those lifestyle changes with you know, mentally stimulated activities. Um, other things that are important as well are safety. Um, so realizing that if that person has dementia at home, um, maybe turning off um, you know, or taking the knobs off of the stove if there's someone who is at risk of leaving the stove on. Um, you know, if there's someone who is likely to go out without their keys, uh, maybe leaving an extra set of keys in their favorite jacket um, so they'll be able to get back. Um, or if there's someone who might go out and wander and get lost, um, you know, giving them a, a GPS token or a smartphone or something like that. Um, those are the types of things that we, we first suggest in terms of safety and making changes at home. Um, in terms of the physical layout of the home, not as much needs to happen for the dementia piece. Of course, with Parkinson's disease, there are changes that happen, but not with the dementia piece. Okay, thank you. Um, and you also talked about um, caregiving needs that would be changed, mm -hmm. uh, that would be changed. So my question is, um, if someone has, a, has severe dementia, and have you know severe cognitive deficits can they ever be alone not if they have a safety concern um there are some people with dementia who will become very kind of relaxed and sedate and they will be happy to just sit in a chair by themselves until someone comes and prompts them to do something um, and if a person naturally has that personality uh, that will become more heightened uh, as their dementia kind of sets in so that person could be safe to maybe be left on their own for short periods of time. Um, but if it is someone who naturally is more active, um, who is someone who will try to get up on their own or try to do things on their own, not realizing that it's not safe, but they're more of a, that uh, kind of agitated or active personality, then unfortunately, no, with moderate to severe dementia, they wouldn't be safe to be left on their own. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we have one more question here in the chat box. Yeah. So does lack of sleep with Parkinson's increase the chance of developing dementia? Um, poor sleep does have an effect on your, on your blood pressure um, and poor sleep does have an effect on your cholesterol as well. Um, so because of that, it can, from a physical point of view, increase your risk of dementia. Um, from a psychological point of view, it can also increase your risk of dementia because it does cause more stress. Um, lack of sleep, of course, is a very aggravating situation to be in. Um, and so that can change the chemical balance of your brain. 
And so as that chemical challenge, the balance changes, your acetylcholine will drop, your serotonin will drop, and that also puts you at a higher risk of dementia. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Parmar. That was a really informative presentation, and, and we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to do this presentation for us today and answering all of those questions. And I want to thank all of you for attending. Um, some really good questions in the chat box, and I'm glad uh, Dr. Palmer could answer so many of them. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thank you and um, have a great afternoon. Thanks Thank again. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks again. Bye.